Hey, how's it going? I'm Alex. I'm a fourth year CS student. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Kun Gao. Uh, he's the co-founder of Crunchyroll. Uh, it is the global streaming platform that brings Japanese anime uh, to millions of fans, uh, translated into a ton of languages, broad set of devices. Um, as of last year, um, they've been able to simulcast four out of five on-air shows, like m literally minutes after they've aired on live TV. Um, and they have over, I think, 700,000 premium subscribers. It's pretty exciting. Uh, he's also a Cal Bear, graduated in 04, uh, Eeks, and applied math double major. So, pretty smart guy. Here he is. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. He took all my best material. Um, so I'd like to start by um, first giving you guys uh, a little bit of a trailer uh, of uh, what Crunchyroll is about, and then I'm going to talk about uh, what we do, and then I want to give you uh, some of the lessons that uh, I've learned on this, uh, on this journey. So with that, we'll start with the, the trailer. So, who's the anime fan here? Very cool. Um, So uh, uh, anime is, um, the definition is it's, it's Japanese animation, uh, but it's produced and created uh, within the Japanese uh, uh, animation system. Uh, and uh, there's a reason why it's really compelling. Uh, it's, uh, it's something, it's a, it's a genre of content that we're seeing completely explode. Uh, we're seeing the millennial audience really embrace animation as part of the uh, general global pop culture of everything else they enjoy, along with other verticals like uh, sci-fi, like e-sports. E um, there's a lot of reasons I, I can dive into more of why animation, Japanese anime, is such a compelling uh, content category, um, and you know, we can talk uh, end endlessly about that. Uh, so to start, let me tell you more about uh, what Crunchyroll does and, and who we are. Um, we are uh, about 170 people uh, in downtown San Francisco. We also have a, a small office in uh, Tokyo, Japan, focusing on business development, uh, as well as uh, partnerships and uh, co-production. Co uh, we're all very passionate about this space, about, uh, cr about creating content, about delivering content, and delivering a digital experience for, uh, for the next generation of premium content consumers. Uh, we have a lot of uh, industry expertise from uh, companies that you might, uh, you might recognize. And what makes Crunchyroll special, what makes us really unique is that um, we are one of the biggest SVOD companies in the world. We're a top 10 SVOD company in the world. And that is actually extremely scarce. If you look at uh, the subscription VOD businesses out there, uh, there's Netflix, there's Hulu, uh, there's Amazon, there's uh, HBO, and then there, there's us. And uh, to be able to get to hundreds of thousands of paid subscribers uh, is a scarce, a very scarce asset. 
secondly, we have an independent platform. That means uh, we built and operate our own digital distribution platform. Uh, and what you find is that for the people at the very top of the SBOT business, they all own and operate their own digital distribution platforms because that's what you need to be able to be successful at the very top. And then third is uh, today we're seeing a lot of companies want to get into OTT. Uh, they might be traditional media companies that are trying to launch new services. But what we found is that uh, it's not really that simple. Uh, there's actually quite a lot of growth science behind it, uh, what we call growth science. And it's not just about how do you uh, get viewers. It's about how do you make a premium value proposition that has viewers paying you every single month. So there's an aspect of how do you capture users, how do you convert them into paid subscribers, and how do you retain them over time, manage churn, and, and so forth. Um, we have a strong set of investors backing us. Uh, the Churnin Group, uh, you, you might not know them, but they are probably the biggest independent media company uh, in Hollywood. Uh, and it's uh, um, owned and operated by Peter Churnin, who is also a Berkeley, uh, Berkeley alum. Uh, he used to be the CEO and president of Fox, and he produced such great movies as uh, Planet of the Apes, uh, and he's producing, I, I believe, New Girl on TV right now. Uh, additionally, uh, we, we have investment from AT&T and DirecTV. They're now one company. Uh, and we have investment from uh, TV Tokyo, who is the biggest uh, anime broadcaster in, in Japan. Uh, so what, what do we do? Uh, we are uh, self-defined, the number one streaming anime company in the world. Uh, we stream into multiple languages within minutes of original TV broadcast. And we really much value uh, our ability to uh, deliver from a technical and product perspective, as well as our expertise in navigating, understanding the licensing that it takes, not just from a content perspective, but also from a relationship perspective with a completely different country. And finally, we think that what we're building is so much more than just content. It's about a lifestyle experience. Uh, and to be able to do that, we need to be fans uh, ourselves, and we need to understand the community going into that lifestyle experience. Uh, so this is just a very high-level uh, roadmap of uh, where we've been. Uh, founded in 2006 as a Nights and Weekends passion project, uh, and then received in initial investment beginning of 2008 from Vinrock. Uh, we have uh, formed a subsidiary in Japan very early on. Um, our thinking there was um, if we're going to be uh, uh, licensing content from Japan, uh, it made a lot of sense to uh, physically establish an office there to uh, communicate face-to-face -face with uh, our, our licensors and our partners uh, er every single day. Um, and then we launched a bunch of uh, device applications. Uh, we have investment from uh, one of our biggest uh, licensors and the biggest distributor of Japanese animation in Japan. Uh, and then uh, later on took investment from uh, the Churnin Group. Uh, and then uh, finally we uh, rebranded our platform to be called Elation, which is uh, our B2B branding for how we uh, grow the next phase of, of our business. So. This tells you a little bit more about how we're thinking broadly about uh, what kind of experience we're trying to build. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, the traditional media ecosystem and you look at uh, the new media ecosystem, uh, in the traditional media ecosystem, which most of you probably don't really uh, experience today because most people here don't really watch traditional TV, uh, is you have these big broadcast channels, ABC, NBC, Fox, uh, CBS, and they're all about breadth. And we think in the new ecosystem, uh, that's really a Netflix and a Hulu. They're trying to be a little bit for everyone, and they're trying to reach the broadest audience possible. Now, uh, where we are trying to be is we think in the new ecosystem, there's going to be audience-focused channels. Uh, so if you look at cable, there is uh, obviously like a Cartoon Network, uh, Comedy Central, uh, Food Channel. We think that that model is also going to carry over into uh, the new media ecosystem. Uh, and content will be delivered directly over the top to uh, consumers of those in intra interests. Um, but additionally, we think that uh, that enables a completely new experience that's not possible before. 
Uh, before, it's all about how do you push content, how do you get people to watch content. Uh, today, it's really about how do you get people to engage. So with Japanese animation, we think content is really the starting point. Uh, but there's so much more about that content experience. Uh, for example, uh, if you know anime, you'll know that a lot of the animation comes from Japanese manga or comics. And uh, we digitally distribute comics. Within uh, minutes of it hitting newsstands in Japan, uh, we digitally distribute it on our platform. Uh, additionally, we create our own content. We have a very vibrant news service built around uh, everything that uh, anime fans want to read around, uh, around uh, news. Uh, we very much care about community. What you'll find is that uh, we have uh, pr presence, physical ex uh, presence at many different conventions, and we think that uh, the new uh, lifestyle experience uh, in the new uh, ecosystem. It's very much not just about uh, content and uh, viewing, it's about participation and it's about uh, ex experiencing things. And finally, uh, e-commerce we believe is very central to the entire experience. When people watch and they engage, uh, next thing is they, they want to own. So we're seeing a lot of viewers who start watching a show uh, then they would really love it, they read the comics, and then they want to buy the figures related, related to the show. And this is all the kind of things that you need to build to be able to succeed uh, as a uh, audience, uh, target, targeted niche audience platform. Uh, this tells you a little bit more about our content strategy. As Alex said, we, we broadcast four out of five shows that's on air on TV in Japan within minutes of original TV broadcast. Uh, we have uh, a number of popular titles you might recognize, like Naruto, like Attack on Titan, uh, and we are the only foreign company to join the uh, Anime Japan uh, Association of Japanese anima uh, Animation. Uh, in the very early days, uh, we uh, set out to have a very close relationship with our partners, and so joining this association means we get even closer to the anime studios that uh, is creating the content that we're, uh, we're distributing. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about our value proposition. So if viewers pay uh, $7 a month, they get access to the latest shows within minutes of original broadcast uh, in multiple languages. And if they don't pay, that's okay. They can wait one week after each episode airs. Uh, then they can still watch with ads and a little bit lower quality. We found that this works incredibly well uh, with our youth audience. Uh, we found that recency and access to, to the freshest content is extremely, extremely valuable. And we've done a, a ton of testing around uh, the price point as well as the windowing of the content. And what we found is that uh, one week is enough behind the paywall uh, to be able to attract a large number of paying, uh, paying subscribers. Uh, so we also have a uh, $12 price point. What we found, uh, found is that with really passionate audiences, you have a, a sub-segment who's willing to go above and beyond, who's willing to pay even more for uh, potentially not much more uh, perceived, uh, perceived uh, hard value. They're actually paying for a perceived value of being able to donate even more to, uh, to, to what they really love. Uh, we are widely distributed on every single platform, uh, with the exception of maybe uh, a, a Netflix. Uh, we, we have more coverage on, on devices than any other, any other platform. And I think this really uh, is a byproduct of the very early days. Uh, we were primarily a tech and engineering organization. And uh, most, of the, most of the company was in engineers, including myself. And uh, we didn't really have a lot of business capabilities. And so we didn't have a lot of business levers. So the only levers we could really pull on was building stuff. And so we just built the heck out of it. Uh, and we just distributed it as widely as possible on devices, built a ton of features. Uh, and and that's really, that was actually the right decision at the time. Um, we have a lot of reach on social, millions of uh, Facebook likes. Uh, we have our own uh, newsletter distribution with half a million, uh, with five million uh, active opt-in viewers, uh, and and so forth. And uh, if you ever go to an anime convention, you'll see that we have probably the biggest presence. Uh, this is actually what our booth uh, looks like. Uh, we've seen an explosion of uh, people attending anime conventions. Uh, just like uh, with Comic-Con, we don't think it's really a fad. We think that with uh, 
our particular audience, which is millennials, uh, they're very much about experience and about attendance and about uh, participation. And so uh, the growth in offline engagement uh, is very important. Uh, and being able to uh, represent our brand and what we stand for is very important at these physical, uh, physical e events. A uh, little bit more about our global service. Uh, so we actually localize all the content into uh, eight different languages within minutes of original TV broadcast. Uh, we have a, about 250 people globally who are typing really, really quickly. Um, they, they ac we actually get the, the content about uh, seven days before TV broadcast and we're able to then take the time to, uh, to, to localize uh, appropriately. Uh, we have a lot of physical offline presence in many of these key countries. Uh, what's important to note is that um, a lot of people think subtitling is just a means to understanding the content. We actually treat it as part of the premium value proposition. So if you, if you think about a customer paying you for something, uh, they're paying you for that entire experience and the subtitling is actually a very important piece of that. Uh, so what we do is we found that uh, some translators are actually much better at translating certain aspects of, co of animation than others. And so we, we, we test our translators and then we uh, figure out what aspects are they best at translating. Uh, some are very good at translating shown in action, some are very good at translating historical references, some are very good at translating uh, moe. Uh, so uh, we try to match them with the, uh, the best uh, possible uh, translators for the appropriate show. Uh, and then they provide our premium uh, viewers with the best possible experience. Uh, so this is what I was talking about a little bit more earlier is that we're now taking a very much brand centric approach to how we uh, distribute content. It's really about building that lifestyle experience and it starts with one content at a time. Uh, so very early on, I think still many companies do this, is uh, they just want to get the content out there. For us, it's about how do you not just get a piece of content out there, how do you build engagement with that brand? And what that means for us is being able to stream the, tr the show, at the same time we're making the comic available, at the same time we're importing merchandise, at the same time we're bringing the voice actors or the producers out to one of our conventions and all of that is tied together with our uh, premium uh, subscriber experience. So if you're a premium subscriber, obviously you get the content, you get a discount of savings in the e-commerce store, you get access to all the latest manga and you get front of the line access to all of our, all of our conventions. And we've been able to showcase that doing this creates incredible amount of lift across all the different ways we operate the business. Uh, for a number of the titles that, that we've showcased, uh, we've made them into uh, blockbuster hits. Uh, a little bit more about what um, the future looks like for us. So um, as I indicated earlier, growth science is incredibly important for us. Uh, today we have hundreds of thousands of paying subscribers, uh, tens of millions of registered viewers, uh, and we've seen an incredible amount of growth. Um, they're using many different devices, uh, they're accessing the content wherever they want to, uh, but I think the next stage for us is really about how do we get really smart about the data that this audience is generating, uh, generating for us. And to be able to do that, you have to obviously own and operate your own platform. Uh, this is just a very high level road uh, view of uh, all the tech that's going in under the hood. Uh, but what uh, we found very important is that uh, data is going to be uh, extremely critical to the next generation of content experiences. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more uh, why. Uh, continuous innovation is something we truly, uh, truly believe in. And what that gives us is the ability to create a flywheel. Um, and this flywheel is enabled by uh, continuing to invest into innovation. That investment into innovation allows us to get a greater scale and it allows us to then increase the monetiz monetization of our users. And with the scale and the monetization, we're now able to then make more money and be able to reinvest that back into more innovation. Until you set up a flywheel like this when your company is not at scale, it's incredibly difficult to make the type of investments you need to make to be able to compete with companies uh, that have this flywheel going. Uh, so as an example, companies like Google are just you know, incredibly good at this. Uh, they continuously to innovate, which increases scale, which then uh, increases monetization, which then makes them more money to allow them to continue to in invest into innovation. And the next step of innovation for us 
is really on the audience analytics and the audience insight. Uh, this is obviously very cursory in terms of the type of data we are getting from our audience. We know exactly uh, who they are. We know exactly what they're watching. We know their age. We know uh, a, a lot of different parameters. Uh, but I think what we found really insightful is the uh, more of the psychographic uh, data that we're getting from this audience. And from that, we're able to look at their viewer, viewership history and their viewership patterns. We're able to match the content that is they're watching, uh, along with uh, micro-tagging of the content, along with qualitative analysis of the content to really figure out, okay, what performs well in Japan? What perform, performs well overseas? Uh, what are the themes that uh, perform really well and resonate really well with this audience? So for example, we can tell you strong female leads is actually an incredibly good indicator against the performance of, of a show. And what this allows us be able to do is, up until now, Japanese animation has been a domestic product uh, created to satisfy a domestic audience. Uh, but we're now seeing a disruption in that, uh, in that, in that uh, content creation process. Uh, domestically, Japanese population continues to decline. Uh, domestically, their monetization uh, opportunities are continuing to decline. Uh, their business has always been propped up by distribution of home video. Uh, and we're seeing the DVD sales uh, continue to plummet. Now, that actually represents a huge opportunity for us because previously they were making content so that they can go sell DVDs in Japan. Now they aren't making as money, much money from that, and so they're trying to figure out, okay, how do I make my content more globally accessible uh, for a global audience? And we are the platform that's providing them with this incredible insight and analytics uh, into what kind of content they should be creating to make their product more globally accessible uh, for the next generation of, of, of their viewers. And so that's a very quick overview of the kind of things that we're working on and we're, we're thinking about at Crunchyroll. <clears throat> so uh, the next section, I wanna talk about uh, lessons learned. Um, I think some of these are probably really general, but it's uh, things that uh, I've personally lived through and my team has personally lived through. And uh, this is all really you know, fresh material, so it might not be as, uh, as polished. And I thought about you know, what's the best way to deliver this to you. And uh, what I found really uh, engaging for myself is uh, finding a quote that ties into what uh, I think is a valuable lesson that I I've learned. And I think you, know, you look at the, the company that I've built and the scale and the size that we are operating today, uh, and it's, it's, you know, the, the takeaway is that's great. You know, there's a big company there. There's some really interesting things that hopefully you're doing. Um, but I think um, uh, it all starts from, from nothing. It all starts from an idea. It all starts from one person or two people or three people getting together and saying, this is what I really want to do. This is what I want to try. Um, Every company, every you know, billion dollar, $10 billion company out there, it all started with one or two people. And I think that's what uh, you need to keep, keep in mind. Um, and so the first lesson is, uh, I think, is um, the reason we struggle with insecurity is we compare our, our behind the scenes with everyone else's uh, highlight reel. Um, I think this res really resonates well for me is um, when, when, you're, when you're out there, when you're in uh, Silicon Valley, when you have your own startups, uh, every day you're seeing news on TechCrunch. Every day you're seeing, uh, okay, this other competitor is doing so much better or uh, you know, why, why aren't we measuring up? I think uh, what you have to keep in mind is that you see everything, you see all the lows and all the highs, but you only see the highs for everyone else. And so uh, it's incredibly important to have that perspective. And every company starts with just an idea and uh, a few people getting really excited about that to be able to, to actually want to, want to do something. In the early days, uh, our website look, looked like crap. Um, and I think, uh, actually, I took, I took the next you know, 20 different slides from a presentation I did in uh, like 20, 2012. Uh, so you get a taste of uh, what you know, a few years ago we, we, we were like, uh, and the slides all, all reflect that. So um, I think w in the very early days, um, it was really a nights and weekends passion project. 
uh, we were working day jobs. Uh, we uh, were you know, at night going home at you know, 10 p.m. and then coding, uh, go to sleep at 3, show up at work at noon. Boss wasn't that happy. Um, and then on the weekends, we were coding. Uh, and we were doing both the hardware and, and, and the software side. Um, back in 2007, you couldn't buy servers. There wasn't an Amazon cloud. We built our own servers because that was cheaper than Dell, and Dell was really cheap. Um, and we had a lot of different uh, challenges. One of them was uh, even if you buy a server then, you couldn't get enough storage into the servers. So we went up, went, went really ghetto, and we just plugged a bunch of external hard drives into, into our servers. Um, and, and, and that worked. Uh, and I, I think um, you, could, you could obviously over-engineer uh, your problems, uh, but I think what uh, that really taught us and taught me is um, you know, vision is really, day, uh, vision without execution is just daydreaming. Um, the most important thing you can do is go out there and actually do something. I think this stops 99.9% .9 of the people out there. Uh, they think, okay, this is, this is a great vision. Here's an idea I'm going to pitch you. There's probably 100 people out there with exactly the same idea as you for starting a company, but 99 of them won't do anything about it. So if you do something about it, uh, you're going to be farther along than all of them. Uh, this is our org chart in 2007. Um, more advisors than people working. Um, and uh, I think very early days, we were really, really scrappy. Uh, what was, you know, worked really well for us is um, at the time, uh, we were all engineers. We were all building uh, this platform. We were all coding. Uh, video delivery was really new. So we ended up just having the right set of folks to be able to uh, build uh, what we needed to build and ship, uh, ship really quickly. I think you can, you can get stuck into uh, overthinking the problem. You can get stuck into, well, how, how do I find folks with capabilities? I think um, at least speaking for the uh, software engineer side, of um, uh, which is my background, you already have all the tools that you need to be able to build all of it yourself. Uh, and that's a huge advantage. So you, you should absolutely go do that. Kun, while you're, can you go back to that chart for just a second? I'm curious. How do you know those people? Um, so uh, James Hong Jim Young uh, founded Hot or Not. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that site. It's this site where you rate people from 1 to 10 um, based on hotness. Uh, and then, uh, so I guess originally, uh, when I was about to graduate in 2004, uh, I, I had a choice. I, I could either take an internship at uh, VMware. Uh, this was VMware pre-IPO, so I don't know if I made the right choice. Uh, but uh, VMware versus um, working at Hot or Not. And working at Hot or Not, uh, Jim, I knew Jim and James. They were uh, they're both Eeks uh, alumni, and they said, hey, why don't you join for three months and you'll learn um, how easy it is to go build your own website, to go build your own product. I think um, if I hadn't done that, none of this would, would have happened. Uh, and so uh, they also helped me introduce to uh, some of the other folks on here, like Max Levchin, CTO of PayPal, uh, Ashwin Evan, who used to run uh, BitTorrent, uh, and then uh, Naval Ravikant, who is a uh, founder of AngelList. Uh, and then a couple other friends as well. So I think it's having that alumni con connection that really helped to, uh, to, to bring, bring me to where I am today. Uh, so very early days, there was just a lot of, uh, I, this is actually came, coming from a, a, a deck for, for our VC. Um, it's incredibly ghetto. Uh, we, were, we were trying to figure out what does a video ad look like back then because there, there were no video ads. Uh, we thought it'd just be a, a, a banner or a pop-up, but it didn't really, it didn't really matter. Um, and then in uh, 2008, uh, we were able to secure the uh, license to Naruto. And this is the, uh, if, you didn't, if you don't know, this is the biggest show for, for animation. This is, the, there's, this is their Game of Thrones. Um, and what's interesting is no one told us you can't do that. Um, it's better to be naive and hopeful than to be experienced and, and jaded. And I think if, we, if, if people told us how hard it would be, I don't know if back then we would have made the conscious choice, choice to say, let's, let's keep, keep doing that. I think being naive 
uh, helps you to continue to, to, to go out there and to weather that storm. But I think also what this says is that uh, people with experience in your industry probably uh, aren't as helpful as you might think. Uh, and a lot of the reason is because um, their experience and what they learned actually is counterintuitive to what you should be doing. Uh, if you think about this, you're trying to go build something completely new, something that no one's ever done before. Um, do, do, does anyone have an idea how that's, uh, how that's supposed to go? Not really. And what experience doesn't help you with is experience uh, might cause you to eliminate things you would never have investigated before. Uh, because uh, when we started, people uh, were telling us, you would never be able to license this show because no one's ever licensed digital rights for animation. Uh, there wasn't such a thing. Uh, why would they ever work with you? Um, but you know, we, we didn't care, so um, I actually went out to Japan after we raised VC funding, and the charter for me was, uh, when we started, we were basically making a YouTube for, uh, for, for any kind of content, just because we wanted to figure out how, to, uh, how content video distribution works. We shared it with our Asian friends. They upload a lot of pirated Asian content. Uh, and then um, we found that anime was really sticky. There was a community around it. There were, the content co uh, vertical is really compelling. And we, when we raised VC funding, um, I said, okay, let's go to... Let's go to Japan. Let's go license this content uh, because we know that we we know this is premium content. We're not going to go down a path where we're just going to be a YouTube and we're going to be a user generator or contributed platform because there's no there's, that's a dead end. Uh, so we need to go license the content. We need to go make it into a premium service. We need to take down all the unlicensed content. We need to make it into a business. And the first step of that is uh, actually license the content. Uh, I didn't know anyone uh, in Japan. I didn't speak Japanese, so. Um, I checked with uh, our advisors. Uh, one of them knew someone uh, in Japan, and he said, okay, go talk to this guy. Uh, and then that guy ended up running, he's still running our Japan office. Uh, but he didn't know anyone in anime either, so uh, we basically just started knocking on doors and trying to find the next guy who knew something more about anime than the previous guy. And we just kept doing that for a whole summer. Uh, had our backpacks on, it was really hot in Tokyo, and we were just knocking on doors. Uh, fortunately, we. Co correct. We were literally going and, and, and doing the visits. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a lot of work, um, but like that's, that's what we thought was the best path to be able to directly go and find the people who are going to license content to us. Um, well, I think um, we were persistent. Um, that was incredibly important. We, uh, we seem like honest people, I guess. Uh, we, we, and, we, and we told them, and we were extremely genuine. We, we told them what we really wanted. We said, look, we have a platform with millions of your viewers. Today, they're not watching legally. We know you have no distribution business outside of Japan. And this is going to potentially be uh, very interesting. At least you can monetize. You could reach audience. You can tell us to take down the content, but all the viewers will just flock to BitTorrent, and then they'll go uh, a thousand different directions. And what we told them was we wanted to build a, a clean, well-lit place for their brand. And that message resonated really, really, uh, really well. I think it's really the honesty and the persistence that, that helped us. So that was the, the pact we, we made. I, we said, we think the best path is to take down all this content. Uh, and they said, great, because we would not license you any other way. Uh, because when there's one piece of premium content, there can't be many pieces of unpremium content or illegally uploaded content next to it. And so uh, we segue to the, to the, uh, to the next slide. Uh, we transitioned to a 100% licensed model. Uh, and we did it very abruptly. We, we, New Year's Eve 2009, 2008, uh, New Year's Day 2009, we flipped a switch and we took down everything that was uploaded by users and only put up content that we had licensed. At the time, it was like seven simulcast shows and maybe like 20 catalog titles. So not, not very much. And it was a really, really, really tough time because we had no clue what was going to happen to the business, but we knew it was the right thing to do. Uh, so... Uh, I think that brings me to the next point. Um, uh, if you don't know Charles Woodson, he's an Oakland uh, football player. Um, the quote is, it's 
bigger than me, it's bigger than you, but it's, it ain't bigger than us. And I think what you find when you go on a trip for entrepreneurship is that um, the highs are so high, but the lows are so low. And I think one of the only ways that I found to be able to weather that is to be able to do it with, with friends and to be able to do it with like-minded people who are on that journey with you because it's really, really tough to go and do that, do that yourself. Uh, we had days where it was like, oh, do we just turn the business off? Uh, it was, you know, we were, we were massively in debt because you can't make money streaming video back in the day. Uh, we were maxing out our credit cards, uh, but I think we just had a, a conviction, um, a, a almost a religious belief that this was gonna turn out positive. And I think that really helped carry all of us together through, through, the, through the dark times. And then uh, obviously the, the highs are just incredibly high. If you succeed, uh, there's nothing else in the world like uh, being successful, doing, uh, uh, do, do, doing entrepreneurship. Even the small milestones I think are incredibly valuable. So our first milestone February was 10,000 paid subscribers. Um, certainly not enough to pay the bills and very much far off from where our target was supposed to be. And you can, you can kind of see the theme here. Um, even though today we have uh, some 150,000 paid subscribers and next year we're going to hit a million paid subscribers, uh, very early days there wasn't very, very, uh, very much. And so today might be our highlight reel, but back then it was, you know, we were just grinding it out and, and sweating it out. Um, by October, we had slowly ramped up the number of shows we were getting. For reference, in Japan, at any time, there's about 40 or 50 shows on air. Uh, so today, we have uh, 80 to 90 percent of that. Uh, back then, si uh, 16 titles was an incredible accomplishment for us and double the number of simulcasts we had at the beginning of the year. Uh, we also started launching uh, into uh, live action, Korean dramas, J-dramas, etc. And then um, what we realized was uh, 10,000 subscribers and the growth rate just wasn't going to be enough to pay the bills. Um, uh, so what, what do we do then? And we were uh, trying to figure out every possible way to figure out ways to monetize. Um, if, you, if you didn't know the, uh, the environment back then, uh, middle of 2008, everything took a cliff. Uh, no one could raise any money. Uh, and uh, we basically had whatever we had in the bank, and if we couldn't uh, bridge ourselves to the next financing, or if we couldn't get the business to break even, then we would be completely dead. Uh, so we tried everything. We tried uh, casual games, we tried launching a bunch of different features for monetization, we tried taking more donations, um, but you know, it, was, um, it was a really, really tough, uh, tough time. And I think what, what I found uh, really inspiring is that um, if, if this is what you want to do, if this is what you truly want to do, uh, then you, know, you have to really believe and love what you're doing because the tough times are going to be really tough. The exciting times are going to be really exciting. But what gets you through all of that is not the desire to go make money or the desire to be famous. It's the love of what you actually do. And so if you have to ask yourself, if someone said, I won't pay you anything to be an entrepreneur, would you do it? If you said yes, then you absolutely should, should be an entrepreneur. And then uh, about a, you know, a year and a half after we launched, May of 2010, uh, we were at 20,000 subscribers. Uh, we were fortunate to receive uh, uh, a, a little bit of uh, investment from TB Tokyo. Uh, I don't think they realized at the time how close we were to, uh, uh, to uh, running, running out of uh, gas. Uh, we were about three months away from, uh, from uh, running out of money. Um, but um, but we, could see, we could see the curve because subscription business are incredibly predictable. Uh, and so we could see it going like this. And we knew that if we could get just a little bit more, uh, we raised 750000 we could get a little bit more than we could be able to bridge and get to, and get to break even, which is, um, which is what we did. Uh, and then we ended up doing um, uh, launching a, a few different lines of business to continue to drive revenue, uh, including a daily deal for anime-related merchandise, uh, as well as um, started our foray into uh, mobile apps and uh, branded, uh, branded mobile apps. And then we also started doing live streaming um, uh, at co anime conventions, uh, there's a live chat going on. So what happens is if you're at home, you, you watch this, you type to them, they see the, the chat. Uh, so what happens is a lot of times people at home tell the people on the screen to start dancing, and then they do. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and I think this, this speaks to um, really uh, M MVP. 
uh, everything should be as simple as it is, uh, as it can be, but not simpler. Uh, MVP, uh, it's really easy sometimes for you to think through. Uh, if you think uh, it's really you're trying to learn from a test. You're trying to make the simplest test possible to learn something. And uh, over the course of building a business, you have to do many, many, many different tests because uh, what you're trying to accomplish has never been done. There's no blueprint for it. Uh, and what you're trying to get to is building a bigger business or uh, getting more viewers, uh, but you don't know how to do that. But what you can do is do all these little different tests and each test will get you a little bit more understanding of what you should be doing uh, and a, a learning of what doesn't, doesn't work. Um, and then at that point, we were at 50,000 subscribers. We were effectively break even. Uh, and then we ended up sending the whole team to Japan. It was like 20 people. Um, it was an incredibly fun and rewarding time for us because uh, I think at that point we knew, okay, we, we made it because we were break even. Um, and this was about uh, three, almost, almost four years after we uh, after we started uh, and received uh, Series A funding. Uh, so just to give you that perspective, uh, it, you might see the end result today, but it was not always so easy. I think every company of scale, every company doing something interesting, uh, sometime during the life of that company, they had to go and struggle and have really tough times and wrestle with those tough decisions. Uh, but I think that's what really defines what you're doing and really defines uh, yourself as entre entrepreneurs. Uh, 75,000 subscribers in uh, beginning of January 2012. Uh, we then start, started launching into uh, new territories. Um, I think this is primarily, um, you can make a business case for it, but we just felt that the internet was about reducing barriers. And at that time, content distribution was very fragmented. You would license content into a specific country for a specific language. Um, and so we said, well, why don't we just go and try to make this thing as global as possible? Uh, we continue to uh, wrestle with that today, but I think we're, uh, we're at the point where people realize globalization of content is the right way, right way to go. But it, it started with our investments all the way back into, into 2012. So it is good to have uh, more foresight to think about what, where you really want to be and to start doing that, doing that now. And then uh, later on, we launched onto uh, living room devices, uh, PlayStation, uh, Xbox, uh, and then we continued to grow our subscriber base. And in December of 2012, we were at 150,000 uh, subscribers. Uh, we got our new shiny office. Uh, this is on 2nd and Market Street. We actually moved from here to an even bigger office uh, about two, year, two, years, uh, two years later. Um, and then we started launching into additional lines of businesses like uh, a full-fledged uh, full e-commerce uh, e store, all to fulfill the vision that we think this is very much a lifestyle experience, that it's not just about content delivery, it's about how do you get people engaged with uh, merchandising, with offline, with uh, reading comics, as well as watching content. And then uh, end of 2013, we received uh, investment from Peter Chernin and uh, uh, the, the Chernin Group. And then uh, end of that year, we hit about 250,000 subscribers. Um, and I think what uh, my learning from all of this is um, it's incredibly important to have a big goal, a big, uh, a big ambition. Uh, far better is it to dare mighty things to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank uh, with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in a great twilight that knows not victory or defeat. So. Um, you have, to, you have to think big, you have to dream big, you have to want to go and always challenge yourself and go and try and, and get the next hurdle. Uh, when we were at 10,000 subscribers, we would have never thought we could, we could be at 700,000. We were just thinking, can we get to 50? But when we were at 50, we thought, okay, can we get to 100? I think you have to keep challenging yourself and what you're trying to do to continue to be engaged and continue to be passionate about uh, what it is uh, that you're doing. And then um, uh, end of that year, 250,000 subscribers. Today, we're triple that uh, in just, uh, in just uh, two short years. Um, you might not see it, but 
uh, every year from the very beginning, 2009, we were uh, doubling our subscriber base year over year over year. It's just that when the base is small, uh, you might think that the results are not there, but uh, you continue to build, keep building on that base and continue to keep growing the business so that even today, even if we're growing by a, uh, you know, a 20%, 30% quarter on quarter, it's, it's a huge base and then you're able to uh, grow the business so much more. And then I think the, the final uh, uh, lesson I want to leave with you, I, I don't know why there's so many football references, but uh, um, I think you know, success isn't owned, it's leased, and rent is due every day. So I think this tells you that, I, I feel that you know, if, you, if you think you have a level of success, it's not, it's not the success that, measure, that defines who you are. It's the fact that you're able to do something and the success is, a, is really a result uh, result of that. And uh, if you feel like you reached a level where you're successful, um, you, you can't just go sit on your laurels. You have to go keep proving that every single day because it's what you're capable of that defines the success, not what you've done in the past. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. I mean, if you can't guess, Kuhn is passionate, and uh, I think a couple few years ago you were on Quora and you were like AMA, which I'm so excited because, <laughs> as you all know, I'm so nerdy. I was like, "Ooh, what does that mean? Ask me anything." So, does that still count? Absolutely. Okay. No hard questions. <laughs> so, A H A, ask him anything. Uh, I'm, I am Joseph. I'm CS and math major. Uh, so I'm very curious about the, your decision that you take down all the unlicensed like uh, videos and put on the licensed one. And do you, uh, did you make any tests before that? Or and also, how do you deal with like the loss of in retention afterwards? I'm sure there's a lot of loss, a lot of like uh, uh, like watch were, were left because of that. Um, so we didn't do a test because uh, it's, it's really tough to, to do that kind of test. Uh, we knew there were data points in the market. I think uh, if you look back at that time, uh, services like uh, uh, Mininova tried to go legitimate, uh, lost all their traffic. Uh, what we, when we knew that we were going to go down this path and, and become uh, legitimate, we invested a ton into community and into engagement. Uh, we were building a lot of social features, like forums, like social networking features, uh, because we felt that uh, community was going to help keep uh, folks that were uh, on, uh, you know, on the border to keep coming back to our service. And I think one of the things that we did right very early on is uh, because we were also fans and we understood the mentality of the fans, uh, and it's very much an online community experience. Uh, we created um, an, an avatar, if you will, a webmaster to represent our voice to, to, the, to the viewers. Um, uh, we, we call him uh, Shinji from uh, Ava, uh, which is a, one of the most popular anime. Um, and if you haven't seen the anime, Shinji is incredibly idealistic. Uh, but we felt that we wanted to use an avatar to communicate what we truly felt to the, to, to the end users. And so a lot of our viewers, uh, they, you know, every, every few days we would post the Shinji and say, hey, we added new servers, or hey, we released this new feature. And then uh, over time, they, be, they began to trust um, us through Shinji, uh, through our avatar. And then um, on the day when we flipped the switch, it wasn't just, hey, guys, you know, you know, here's, you know, we're going to do the cutoff. We actually communicated with our fans and we said, look, if you love animation, um, we we'll communicate as Shinji, we, if you love animation, um, then you have to believe this is the right thing to do. Uh, that uh, if this is the content you enjoy watching, then there are people making it who uh, it costs them money, it, it, it's very expensive, uh, they're putting their uh, sweat and, and, and blood and tears into it, uh, then you, you have to be part of this community where uh, you do it legally. And so we said, uh, okay, you, you, can, you can pay us a subscription fee or you can watch for free, which is also okay because we're getting revenue from the ads as well. Um, and so we flipped the switch. Obviously not everyone stuck around. I think we lost uh, half our traffic within uh, like a month. Uh, and then it was a gradual decline for the rest of 29, uh, 2009. 
but we just felt, you know, that was kind of a, a, a proving point, right? If you, if you have the best anime title of all time, you have it on your service, and you have a community, and it still doesn't work, then I think you've kind of tried everything. Uh, so we said, you know, that's kind of our line in the sand, and this is what we're gonna, going to do. And then, uh, you know, true enough, over time, our traffic continued to, continue to grow and get back up. We added more content. We continue to uh, be very direct with our community, and we've been able to you know, build from there. Good. Thank you. So I told people outside that they would get priority, so just FYI, you'll know. Over here, back here. Okay. Uh, are you ever concerned that aggregators like Netflix might ever enter your space? Um, <clears throat> so, um, absolutely, but I think it really comes down to um, what we think we're building and what we think we mean to the audience and what they're building. Uh, in the new e OTT ecosystem, we think that there's going to be broad broadcast channels where it's going to be, uh, they're going to mean a little bit to everyone. Uh, they don't mean everything to everyone, they mean a little bit to everyone. So uh, these broadcast networks, by definition, have to be broad in terms of what content they curate. Uh, they're not going to build the deepest uh, offering for uh, c a comedy. They're not going to build the deepest offering for esports. They're not going to build the deepest offering for animation. They might have uh, a few titles here and there are curated to a general audience taste, uh, but they're not going to go deep. And we fundamentally, I fundamentally believe that uh, for the new media ecosystem, there has to be services that go really, really deep into, uh, into different audiences. And deep doesn't mean narrow. It just means that you're ready to provide a level of experience that is not possible that these fans love and they, and they embrace. So uh, a broad service would never be able to, for example, uh, deliver a comic. They would never be able to sell merchandise. They would never be able to bring the creators and the producers that these fans love to these conventions. They would never have a engaging social uh, media experience. They would never be uh, ha you know, have engaging forums. And so those are the things that we really focus on to uh, cr create uh, a deeper engagement. And we feel like if we keep doing that, then we're, we're, you know, we're doing what we set out to do, which is build the deepest, most engaging possible experience for the core anime audience. Hi, my name is Linda, and I actually used Crunchyroll when I was in high school, so I was one of your very early users, and it's cool to see the company evolve. Um, I'm As a fourth-year business student, I really care about brands and the business aspect, and I'm just very curious to hear um, your opinion on this question, which is, for um, customers who use, your, um, use Crunchyroll, what do they want the brand to say about themselves? Thanks. Uh, so you, you touch on a great point, and I think that there's actually, um, um, there's actually a connection with the previous question. Um, we think about the brand, brands in our universe, we think about it as, um, um, uh, we call it a t-shirt test. Uh, so if you really love something, if you really engage with something, you're willing to, to wear that t-shirt uh, and because that tells people your passion and your interest. Uh, so for Crunchyroll, what we try to uh, embody is we try to bring the entire anime lifestyle experience to fans and we try to close the gap between people who create content and people who consume the content. Um, and we try to be uh, in interesting, engaging, we try to be uh, you know, more edgy, we try to uh, really embrace what our audience values are. Um, and so you'll see people who wear a Crunchyroll t-shirt, uh, but you won't see many people wearing a, a CBS t-shirt or, uh, or even a, a Netflix, uh, Netflix t-shirt. Yeah, so, so you need to, if you can build that level of engagement, if you can get people to be excited to wear your t-shirt, then I think you, you, you've built enough value into the brand that, uh, that uh, is meaningful. Hi, my name is uh, Chris. Maybe, yeah, okay, my name is Chris. And I was curious, uh, you had a startup uh, before Crunchyroll, Code Mobs. What did you learn uh, from the original startup that you're able to implement into the success of Crunchyroll? Um, so, with uh, Code Mobs, um, 
So to, to back that up even more, um, my first start startup was actually not related to any of this. Uh, my second startup was Code Mobs. Um, and with that, um, the thinking we had was um, we wanted to, myself and the other folks who started Code Mobs, we wanted to try a lot of different things. Online video was actually one of them. Uh, but we had a, 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 a few different ideas. And uh, what we thought about was how do you get an MVP out there and just throw it out there and test and see if you can get traction. And so within Code Mobs, we actually incubated three or four different ideas. And Crunchyroll was actually the one that took off. So then we took Code Mobs, and then we uh, reincorporated as Crunchyroll, and then uh, we moved forward from, from there. Uh, but I think the learning there is, uh, again, it's on the MVP point. And I think uh, if, uh, at the beginning, if it's incredibly important to find, uh, to find fit and, and audience fit and, and traction, because I think that's the hardest thing to do. Uh, if you can't find find that traction, find that fit, um, I think you know it's it's worthwhile to try different ideas to see which ones hit, um, and then and then go and build the ones that get traction. Uh, we we build Crunchyroll and we we continue to invest into Crunchyroll because we were getting amazing traction. We couldn't even keep up uh, with the amount of work that was involved on a nights and weekends basis, and we all ended up quitting our jobs. And then uh, we we didn't even have VC backing at the time, but we, you know we just felt like. You know that was that was the right thing to do, but you know, uh, Code Mobs was set up to be able to try a few different ideas and then find the one that gets traction and then go go build from there. Hi, um, so I was wondering, how does Crunchyroll and um, anime streaming compare to Twitch and um, esports? Because do you guys have a common user base? And I just looked it up. It, um, Crunchyroll has a channel on Twitch, so what's that about? Does it have something to do with original content? And yeah, how, how do your users compare? Um, so we have a channel on Twitch because uh, they're the biggest platform for live streaming, and typically we use that to uh, like uh, live stream things we're doing in, uh, um, uh, in, in our office. It's actually more of a pet project. Um, I would say the broader point you're trying to, uh, trying to touch on, which um, I think makes a lot of sense is that so w if you look at if you look at the uh, traditional ecosystem for content distribution, you have broadcast networks which are the big TV broadcasters, and then you have cable channels, um, and then DirecTV and Comcast forces you to get the whole thing. Uh, so you, even if on average the American family watches like ten channels or eleven channels, you're getting like two hundred channels. Uh, we think that um, the next generation of bundling and next generation of channels is going to be very much audience driven and not just a bundling of random channels. And we also think that um, with this audience, uh, anime is just one of their interests. Uh, but there is overlap. Um, there are f people who are into esports, who are into fantasy, who are into American comics, who are into sci-fi, also happen to love anime and vice versa. And so we're trying to actively push on that thesis and to figure out what is this broader set of channels that uh, our audience and a broader millennial audience will be interested in, uh, in, 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 uh, in consuming. Uh, but this is a really active area of business that we're, we're, we're pushing forward on. Thank you. Up front. Hey, I'm Make it a good one. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> hey, um, should be on, but it's okay. Talk loud. Hey, my name is Jordan. I'm a freshman CS and econ major. Um, right now, I actually have my own project I'm trying to start, but I'm struggling with the finding your initial user base and actually being able to get users at first. How are you able to do that? And how are you able to branch off from your original narrow focus on that user base to actually build a product? Um, there's a lot of different approaches you can take. I think on the business side, um, what you can do is you can do a lot of research. You can try to survey. You can try to figure out, is there a audience that would consume your, 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 your product? Um, I think what I found works for me um, is I try to build something that I personally would use because I know there's at least a use case of one, um, and hopefully, if you make it good enough, there's hopefully there's other people like you who would want to use the same 
the, sa the same product. Um, and you know, some, sometimes uh, I think that's a great, uh, that could be a great approach. Sometimes it, it might not be, but um, I think that's just what works well for, for me is find something you, uh, you personally uh, would use and try to build that thing. Um, actually investing in stocks is the same way. If I don't personally use it, I don't, I don't actually invest in it. But, but, but I, I feel like um, if you're building it yourself, you need to have that understanding of the user at the fundamental level. And there's they're the best, the easiest way to do that is to be the user yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you.